Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm chatting with Dr. Nikki Washington. She's a professor of practice, computer science and gender, sexuality and feminist studies, Duke University, and a director of the Alliance for Identity Inclusive Computing Education. How are you, Dr. Nikki? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for chatting with me today. This is uh, really an honor. I followed you on Twitter for a very, very long time and read a number of your papers. And I think that you sit at a very interesting space, kind of at the intersection of all of these different studies. Just for context, for our friends that may not know you, you've been a, surrounded by computer people your whole life. Yeah. Thank you for having me on the show today. Um, so I grew up in Durham, North Carolina, born and raised. Um, and as many people may know, Durham has a lot of a rich history uh, in the tech space. So there's the Resource Triangle Park area, but there's also a very rich uh, history of Black Wall Street and the Haytai community here. So you've always had a growing community of professionals in education, engineering, um, entrepreneurship, et cetera. So my mom actually was a programmer turned manager at IBM for her entire 30 plus year career. My dad was a teacher, K-12 educator turned administrator for his entire career as well. And so a lot of my community, including my parents' friends, as well as the parents of my friends, were uh, engineers and educators. And so I had exposure to people in the tech space for a very long time since birth. So for folks that are listening who may not be uh, Black women from North Carolina, it's not common for you to be surrounded by an entire village of Black engineering talent, is it? No, not at all. And for us, it was very commonplace. I think we took it for granted growing up until I went to college. And I think that was the turning point for me to recognize that everyone didn't have these spaces. I knew that everyone didn't grow up as privileged as I did, but I just really didn't think about the impact of having people like my mom at home every single day allowing me to kind of tinker and learn and exposing me to computer science and participating in programs and taking classes um, until I got to those early first year courses where things just tended to click a little bit faster for me in programming courses. And when faculty asked me, well, why is that? My uh, conversation was, well, you know, I took programming in high school. I did some programming in middle school as well. So this is not new. It was my first time learning C, for example, it was not my first time learning the program. Even hearing that in 2022 is always impressive when I meet a young person. I, I spoke with a young lady named Eden Wilson, who I think is 15, and she has a whole Python course that she did in her spare time while wow. being a high school student. And she also did a uh, an, a, an AP course. She texted me a couple of days ago that she got a four on her computer science AP course. Oh, my goodness. And what was great about that is that when she went into the teacher to say, I want to take this course, they're like, no, you need to take the remedial one and work your way up, right? And she's like, no, right. she just tested into it. Right. And when they say, well, when they find out what support you have at home, yep. everyone's surprised. That's surprising in 2022, but this wasn't 2022 when you're having these right. conversations, right? I mean, you're coming up at a different time. No, this was 1996 was my freshman year in college. Uh, and and to your point, you know, we had AP computer science at my high school, but I had this idea that I wanted to be a business major and I wanted to get into marketing and advertising because that just sounded interesting. You know, the average 17, 18 year old at that time, we didn't know what we wanted to do. So programming was just something to tinker with. And I actually entered college with the idea of majoring in marketing and minoring in computer science. So the only reason I was taking that programming course in my first year was because I was trying to meet my minor requirements. And it was in that class and that professor, Dr. Nagi Batia, who actually convinced me to change my major to computer science and maybe minor in marketing. And then by my second year, I just ended up dropping the minor altogether and just majoring in CS. And his argument at that time was that it's 1996. You will have a lot more opportunities in computer science as a young black woman by the time you graduate in 2000 than you will probably in marketing or any business field because computer science is really growing and taking off and you want to be in a position to give yourself every opportunity to win. How important is it to be perceived in that way and be encouraged early on and like to have a mentor at that level to say, you know, You've got something and this is the opportunity. Let's let's take that opportunity. It is paramount. And not only at that age, but at every point in my life, 
I tell people there's been someone who's been able to see something in me that I didn't see in myself. And they were able to point me in a direction that would benefit me. And I was just coachable enough, thank goodness, to listen to them and trust that they knew better than I did. Not because I was just some mature young person, because I wasn't. It it was just that I was always like, oh, well, that sounds cool. I guess I'll try it out. And that's literally what I thought about computer science at that time. And every time something else has presented itself to me in terms of professionally or academically, it's been that same kind of, oh, well, that sounds kind of cool. You know, the worst case that can happen is it doesn't work. And then I just go back to what else, whatever it was I was going to do with it. That's such a healthy attitude. I was actually in an, uh, in an interview with a young lady earlier today, and she said, so did you plan your whole career? Like, talk to me about like the master plan. And I'm like, I literally just thought it was kind of cool. And I just have been doing that for the last 30 years, and it's worked out. That's kind of okay. I mean, young people should know that. Absolutely. And I tell people, I don't always know what I want to do long term. Someone asked me recently, I think it was my dean, what's your end game? And I thought, well, that's a good question. I don't really know. You know, I can tell you probably when I want to be doing five years out, maybe 10 years, but I don't, you know, if you tell me longer than that, actually 10 years, I really couldn't tell you. Five years ago, I couldn't tell you that I wanted to be doing what I was doing today. When people listen to conversations that we're going to have about things like identity inclusive education, especially in a uh, politically polarized time when everyone's mad at everybody and suddenly the whole world is cleft in half, us and them. And I try to walk right down the middle because I want everybody to be happy, you know, Mr. Rogers type. Why does it matter? Why why don't we quote just, and I hate this, I always talk about how saying just is the worst thing you can do, but for the purposes of the interview, why don't we just work on computers? Why does it have to be about one's background and how they grew up? Yeah, I think there's the argument that we see a lot of people making, uh, particularly in the social sciences, around how technology consumption is really problematic. And they've been able to demonstrate in really detailed ways how the technologies that we develop are impacting people who are marginalized based on their race, their ethnicity, sexuality, their gender, their class and their ability and all of these intersections, even every part of their identity. If you have some marginalized part, then technology is probably impacting you in a harmful way. And the argument is often we need more people from diverse backgrounds in the development rooms so that they understand because they are intimately aware of how these technologies will impact and hurt their communities. So then there's the argument of let's get more students and more graduates from these identities into the room. Both of these arguments are very true. They are very necessary and we need them. The issue that I find, which is the third argument that people often don't think about, is that what do we do in the meantime? Because There's going to be a lot of harm that is enacted until we get to that point of creating these more diverse development teams. But even in trying to create that and getting students to and through a college degree and then into an academic career, or not even an academic career, excuse me, a professional career, you have a situation where students are showing up and they may be one of the few, if not the only, who looks like them, whatever that is, right, or whatever part of that identity that is. And they're trying to navigate a space that is very harmful and hostile and toxic because they stand out. They're other. They don't look like everyone else. And that's hard enough to deal with. Now you add trying to get a degree. And so a student who may be able to weather the course and graduate with a four-year degree in computing is now going to look at what job opportunity can I find that I can thrive, that I can build this generational wealth that people tell us that computing degrees will help to start to begin. But then they enter in their first year and a work environment that replicates what they just saw at the collegiate level. It's toxic, it's harmful, there's a lot of bias that they're experiencing. And then, oh, by the way, we need you to work on this tool because people are telling me that none of this is really important, right? Technology is neutral. It's just how people use the technology that becomes problematic. But is it? And then flip that and think about how harmful it is for the person who may identify as the only Black person on the team 
who may have to deal with offhand and inappropriate comments about affirmative action, for example, or they may be the only woman on the team who's having to deal with a lot of things that can be considered sexual harassment. If we aren't dealing with the environmental situations that are being presented, we're never going to be able to reach that point where we have more diverse teams that are creating less harmful products and technology. And so my work sits at that point. How do we start to think about developing teams that not only require more diversity, but require everyone, regardless of their identity, to be more equitable and inclusive in the work that they do and in the spaces where they do that work. And so when people tell me that technology is neutral, we have so many examples of why that's not the case right now, especially in 2023, from the AI that is uh, starting to dominate everything and what we see with not only just chat GPT, but what we're seeing with the writer's strike and the actor strike and how that's impacting so many people. But if we take it even steps further, the medical algorithms that are being used that disproportionately harm people who identify as Black, for example, all of the surveillance technology that's starting to be used to monitor people's conversations around reproductive rights or students who are being outed as trans. And so we have to make sure that we understand that computing does not exist in a vacuum. It does not sit outside of what we are doing in society and what we are experiencing. In fact, it's a microcosm of society and it's being used to exacerbate and replicate a lot of the harms that are being experienced in society as a whole. So if we don't start to teach computing students at the K-12 level, but especially at the post-secondary level about the ways that computing is impacted and the ways that it impacts identities, then we are failing as computing faculty to prepare graduates to go out into the world to be these great problem solvers that we talk about. Yeah, you would think that with all of the science fiction movies that we've seen where something bad happens and then someone applies a computer to it with a for loop to do it n times, it always becomes a bad thing n times. I actually had Dr. Um, Ifoma Junwa on the show a couple of months ago, and she was talking about how her book, The Quantified Worker, talked about how when you automate bad stuff, things get worse, whether it be automation in the early 1900s when we started to build uh, assembly lines and started to like track people's hourly work and now tracking their mouse movement and tracking their eye tracking. Uh-huh. That's a cool demo, but that's very uh, scary stuff. And all we're doing is enabling the scale of that to infinite. Absolutely. And the concern, you know, I've, I've had conversations with people who said, well, you know, I'm in the medical field and numbers don't lie. The numbers just are what they are. And I say, okay, well, are they though? Um, So if we take, for example, all of this data, since you're in the medical field, um, let's talk about the software that's being used to make predictions about people's health or likelihood to need something like a kidney transplant or heart surgery. And that data came from somewhere. It came from decades and decades of medical notes from medical professionals who we've already seen are biased in the ways that they treat patients who identify as Black, for example. And if that historical data is what's being used to train these algorithms, then how do we say that the numbers don't lie when the numbers have always lied and been skewed in a way to cause harm to some people? Some of it was unintentional, but some of it was intentional. We have record and history of that as well, which is why it's really important. I believe that we always start to look outside of computing for the sources and the answers to a lot of this, because I think that there has for a very long time been a level of bravado and arrogance around computing and what it can do. And so there are researchers who talk about this idea of techno chauvinism, where technology is the solution to everything, but is it, and should it be? Because again, if we don't understand when we show up on a developer team, the historical context of the harms that can be replicated, then we're again failing in a number of different ways. Yeah. And I think that when people who may be listening, who may be finding themselves becoming, you know, defensive and they might be like, 
don't know, Dr. Washington is saying this, like, I didn't mean to, and I'm sure that they didn't mean to. Uh, you're really calling out the difference between intent versus impact, because intent really at this point in history is not the point. It's about the impact. And when we acknowledge the impact, then we can make changes that are intentional and align our intent with our impact. Yes. And we can even look at some of the work that's coming out now, right? There's the idea that it wasn't intended for this use, but you don't always know when you produce a technology, how it will be used in what different ways. Even the development of the internet itself has been beyond the intended use originally. So we can't really talk about intentions. We have to focus on the impacts and not just the impacts on the consumers of the technologies, but the impacts on the people we hope to create the technology as well. Because again, we're going to continue to create a lot of situations with less diverse teams, which replicates again these problems with the technology when we don't think about the ways in which we are causing harm to each other just sitting in a department or in a room trying to flesh out how this technology is supposed to work. Or in my case, trying to teach a class on whatever it is, if it's a programming course or beyond, when there's different conversations that are happening that are impacting different students' experiences at the university and in this course. One of the things I stress to my students every single day is that everybody is experiencing a different Duke. So you show up and your experience here may be great. You have no problems. You're, you know, on top of the world and having a ball, but there's somebody else who may really be struggling for a number of different reasons. And when you all show up in this classroom, you don't necessarily know the experiences of anyone else unless you start to learn more about these different ways. And I've had students who have said, you know, at the end of the semester, I only ever knew what it was like to be me. And so being able to identify the fact that, oh, there's someone else who's actually having a hard time navigating certain situations here because of their identity has been really impactful and caused them to think twice about not only how they think about their coursework and what they're going to do long term, but how they navigate that department and who they engage with and how they speak up or don't speak up at certain times. It sounds like you're teaching, you're trying to teach empathy. Yes. The question is, where does that come from? Like, why does someone come built in with empathy? You see toddlers with empathy and then you see people lose empathy and you see teenagers. My, I'm deep in the middle of the teens right now. I've got uh, a 15 year old and a 17 year old and we're we're really in the thick of it. Yeah. And I'm really struggling with this idea of like empathy feels intuitive to me and it's just not. How do you teach that to someone who might be a 40 year old programmer who's on a diverse team for the first time? And they're just like, I don't see why this is a problem. This, How do I undo years of lack of empathy? I'm glad you said that because that's one of the arguments of why I think it needs to happen while we're still in the college years, especially because there's a lot of work around trying to create more diversity, equity, and inclusion in these tech companies. And you have these individuals arguing this and also arguing, you know what? I was taught about loops and programming and data structures and databases. And so why are we learning about this? And why are you telling me that I need to worry about this now? When my degree taught me X, Y, and Z, and that's what I'm going to focus on is X, Y, and Z and how to apply that. Because we're arguing that things have to be taught for people to actually make it make sense in the context of their degrees and discipline, that's why I'm pushing for a lot of this work around identity inclusive computing in the education space so that when a student comes out and graduates from their university, they can say, you know what, as part of my four-year program, we did have to take courses that were designed to teach us more about how identity impacts and is impacted by computing. So this is the reason why this matters, because now let's look at the historical context of A, B, and C that also influenced and impacted how we got to X, Y, and Z. And I think that that's really the case is that we have to focus on teaching every student instead of just looking at the goal of let's increase diversity among our students and graduates Yes, let's do that. And in addition to that, let's also make sure that all of the people there, the students, the faculty, the staff who will engage with and impact those students as well, let's make sure they're understanding it as well. Because for a lot of time, 
that work has been focused on the students who are the most marginalized. Like we're trying to broaden participation in computing, but we're centering the students who are already the most impacted. And when we do that, we pour into them and we say, now you've got all of these great skills. We've given you a sense of belonging, hopefully. Now go into this environment and be great. And we put them in an environment with people who have not experienced any of that. They've not taken time to learn about the struggles that students who don't look like them may have. And so we're asking them again to navigate a very harmful environment and swim against the current the entire time and then want to stay in the field when they graduate. Yeah, you're you're asking for additional emotional labor yes. when they already have a full class load. Yes. You have a, a paper that you wrote called Design to Disrupt, a novel course for improving the cultural competence of undergraduate computing students. And one of the things that I like about it that I had not seen before in papers in similar spaces was that you're acknowledging that the work needs to come from everyone. Like I felt like when I read it, I got homework as opposed to the the traditional solution, which is, well, we'll just put more diverse teams together and then it'll be better right? I've always liked to say technology should look like the mall. So if you walk around the mall and you look around, you go, look at look at all the people. You go to the center square, you go to Times Square. Now I would love if my project teams would look like that. But there's no guarantee that a team that looks like the mall or Times Square is going to get along. Uh-huh. That cultural competence, the simple act of getting along with people from all over, from all backgrounds, not just color, but age, background, overseas, et cetera. You gave me homework and I appreciated that in reading that paper. Thank you for reading that, first off. And I think it's actually beyond just getting along. So part of why I am focused on trying to get computing students and faculty to develop a minimum level of cultural confidence is because it's really about making sure you understand the why. I can get along with someone who may be, to an extent, I can tolerate. And by tolerate, you know, getting along can be a very subjective term, right? I can tolerate someone I have to work with who may have very problematic beliefs because one, I need to keep my job. Two, we need to get this work done. And so I can compartmentalize dealing with them. But that doesn't mean that that person has to try to understand anything about my identity. Um, It doesn't mean that they have to take time to self-reflect on the ways in which their identity is shaping the harmful engagement that we may have. And I think that with cultural competence, it's really, from my perspective, about getting students and faculty to understand that not everyone exists and moves like you. And there are historical contexts to the reasons why people feel the way they do, that they engage the way they do. And there's also part of how we were raised, our positionality. So all of the things that have impacted who we are when we show up to this point today, all of that matters in how we engage with each other. And if we don't take time to try to understand not only other people's identities and what brought them to this point, but also reflect on how my identity did and the harms that I may or may not be imposing on people because of my situation, my beliefs and my upbringing, then that's going to continue to create a world of harm. And so for me, cultural competence is about being able to have everyone take time to not only self-reflect, but also understand more about other identities so that they can better engage with and work with diverse groups and create these equitable and inclusive spaces. And there's arguments even because cultural competence is not a term I developed. It's been in social work and psychology, et cetera, and other fields, there's also arguments around cultural humility and how which one should be more preferred option and priority. And some would argue that cultural humility is more important because that requires just the internal reflection and assessment of what have I been doing wrong and constantly checking myself to make sure I'm not causing harm. But there's also the group that argues that both are intertwined already and that part of being culturally competent because the argument is what does competence mean, right? It usually means that there's a stopping point. And when you reach that maximum point, everything is great, but it's really about this continuous need to learn and grow and develop. And that requires 
some level of humility that will allow you to always self-reflect and say, I know that I am never going to be perfect. There is no perfect point, but I am continuously trying. I am acknowledging when harm is created and I am actively choosing to go against recreating that harm as much as possible. I appreciate that. And apologies if the term get along was oh, no. uh, in, in some way indirectly uh, diminutive. If I may actually quote from the, the paper, I really appreciated this sentence here. The course required self-reflection, accountability, changes where necessary, intentionality in design and implementation, and understanding of topics and current events. You're really putting the emotional labor on professors to lead to the people who are leading discussions. You're spreading that intentionality and that accountability throughout so that it is not laying on the shoulders of just one group within the course. Absolutely. And even more than that, I think it's actually putting the responsibility on the faculty to know that you're not the expert anymore in the room. And a lot of times, especially in computing disciplines, when students show up in a class, the professor is expected to be the person who is the expert. And they're pouring into you and teaching you all of these topics that you then use for the next course, which follows that banking model of education that Paolo Freire talks about. And this kind of disrupts that, right? There's this concept of being situated knowers, which uh, was rooted in feminist epistemologies, that everyone shows up with a level of knowledge and expertise and everyone contributes. And that's really what I'm trying to get more faculty to understand. If you're going to do this work, you can't show up and be the expert. The first day of class, I tell everyone, I am not here to tell you what to think or how to think. I'm here to get you to start thinking critically about computing and the ways in which you are engaging with it, building it, interacting with it, et cetera. And we're going to do that via a journey of understanding identity and what constitutes that and how your identities help shape and impact you and as well as how you navigate using technology and developing it. And so it's really important and it takes a lot of the pressure off of people feeling like they have to be the smartest person in the room. No, you just have to show up with the knowledge that you have because I'm not an expert on anything like one of my students said other than being me. But I can show up and facilitate a conversation around topics of race and ethnicity without asking students who identify, for example, as Asian or Native or Black to speak up for their entire race or ethnicity. We can facilitate a conversation of understanding how race was constructed. What does that mean? What's the difference between race and ethnicity? And then let's start to move that into another topic of identity. And then by the second half of the course, we've talked about identities. We've talked about different oppressions that happen to people based on their identities. We've talked about social justice movements related to those identities. And then let's flip this and start thinking about why does this matter in the context of computing? So that second half of the course is strictly about uh, looking at things like surveillance technology, facial recognition technology, healthcare algorithms, voice recognition software, all of these things that we're seeing in the media and in research. And what does that mean now that we've learned a little bit more about identity? How can we start to see the holes that are present with this technology development? Why do you think those holes are there? How could this have been removed or eliminated? And what can we do about it now that we know what's there? How can we start to protect people who are the most harmed from it? And it gets students thinking about that they would never think about before in a class. So it's a lot of journaling, a lot of discussion, a lot of writing, critical reading and thinking and writing in ways that computer science students don't normally have. There's a lot of programming and compiling things in other classes, and we just don't do that. I tell them, this is not your typical computer science course. And I think that they appreciate that because it just forces them to flip a different switch they're not used to using. I appreciate that so much. I mean, at the conclusion of your paper, you call out that the speed at which technology happens, anything that they're going to learn, it's going to be a new thing. Like I'm looking at my degrees on the wall here. All these programming languages other than C are dead. Everything I learned in school is gone, and now it's a new thing. They didn't teach Kubernetes, uh -huh. right? So I went there to learn how to learn, uh -huh. not to learn a specific thing. And it sounds like you're doing the same kind of good work at Duke. Thank you. I really appreciate you chatting with me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
We've been chatting with Dr. Nikki Washington, Professor of Practice, Computer Science and Gender, Sexuality and Feminist Studies, and the Director of the Alliance for Identity Inclusive Computing Education at Duke. You can find her all over online, and I'm going to put links in the show notes to her papers and her website. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>